Right, welcome back. So in the first capsule, we talked about what's necessary to um, establish possession um, with respect to land. Um, and we said that, that requires uh, basically three elements, right? Um, intention. So first we said there has to be an action, so there has to be actual possession. So you have to be there um, and exercise sufficient possession over the land such that um, it's clear to everyone that you intend to possess it. Second, you have to have an intention to do that. You have to have an intention to um, exercise sufficient possession um, in a way that's exclusive and to the exclusion of the rightful owner. And finally, you have to, in fact, actually exclude um, the owner, right? So it has to work, basically. So we'll talk more about now um, this idea of intention, right? Um, which you have in um, the Kiefer case. So Canadian case, you have two neighbors, and there is um, a, 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 a portion of land in between their, their properties, essentially, um, that's, that's subject to various uses. And it's owned by one of the neighbors, um, but mostly used by the other one. And when the other one buys the property, they have, um, they have what we call an easement, um, I think. So they have a right of way um, over the property. which is also a property interest, right? So it's not the same as a license, right? Which we said earlier um, in the course is not a property interest. A license is a right to do something that would otherwise be illegal and generally for a very limited period of time. So if you go to a concert, right? You buy a ticket. The ticket is a license to do something that would, that, um, would otherwise be illegal. Um, and that license allows you to be in the, say, um, stadium where otherwise you wouldn't have a right to be there. That's a license and it's not a property interest. It's essentially right paid toleration of you being there. Um, in contrast, a right of way is a property interest because it's, um, it's, it's more significant and it happens over time. So you have a right to walk over someone's land um, for a specific purpose. So, for instance, your land is what we call enclosed. You don't have access to um, the street. And so you have a right to cross your neighbor's property for the specific purpose of accessing the street. That's your right of way. So you have a property interest. You have an interest in your neighbor's land, which is the right to cross it um, to go do something specific, not to cross it for any reason. So um, the other neighbor has a right of way over that portion of land. However, they make a use of it that is more significant than that. And so they overstep their actual legal interest and therefore they claim that they've acquired ownership after that. So if they overstep their interest, it's one of the things that comes out of the case, it's as if they had no interest for that additional portion. So it's as if they showed up and had no interest, they can acquire the interest that they don't have in the same way as, they, as if they had no interest, right, um, in, in, in possession and eventually right, acquire ownership. And that's what they do. They say, we've made essentially exclusive use of that um, to the exclusion of the other neighbor that was much beyond a right of way and therefore we acquired ownership over it. And the court basically says no for most of the strip of land. So first you have a portion that's used consistently for making deliveries, conducting business, essentially. Court says this is not sufficient to be exclusive use. Then you have another portion where um, exclusive use meaning, right, uh, possession to the exclusion of the owner per that, um, per that legal requirement. 
Then there's a portion where they make, right, the regular upkeep. They take care of it, most of it. And when the owner's away on vacation, then they um, make essentially exclusive use of it by building something temporary over it. Again, the court says no. This is not sufficient because it's not to the exclusion of the rightful owner. And you'll recall in the previous case we looked at, in the previous capsule, we said that the owner exercises their possessory interest in a way that can be far less significant than an adverse possessor. So someone trying to establish possession for the purposes of eventually getting ownership in law. So it's okay for the owner to go away on vacation, right? They don't have to be there all of the time because they don't have to meet the test, as we said. They don't have to tell everyone else that they're in possession because everyone else can know that they are in possession by looking at the land registry. And so they can go away on vacation, make no use of it. That's not inconsistent with ownership, right? People go on vacation and they might allow their neighbors to use the stuff or someone might even use it illegally. And when that's the case, it doesn't matter as long as they're not away for 10 years, as we said, because as soon as they come back, right, and then they complain or exclude the person who's trying to have possession, then the clock starts sticking again. The 10 years starts over because that prescription has stopped running. Finally, there's a third portion of the land um, where they build essentially um, a garage over it. And that's the only portion of the land where the court says that that's sufficient. Of course, because if you build a garage over it, right, then you're excluding the owner because you just build something on it. They, don't, they no longer have access to that land. Um, and if that's done for the requisite period of time, um, then you will acquire eventual ownership by virtue of adverse possession. You have the test I've been mentioning, page 157, which is from the Flying and Flood case. First, you have to have actual possession for the statutory period, so the limitation period, which we said is 10 years in Ontario, by themselves and those through whom they claim. So, you, you know, you can hire employees to show up there and exercise possession for you. Two, the possession was with the intention of excluding from possession the owner of persons entitled to possession. And three, discontinuance of possession for the statutory period, again, the limitation period, by the owner and all others, if any, entitled to possession. So third criteria on there, exclusion, it has to work. You have to actually succeed in having, um, in, in, in having possession to the exclusion of um, the owner. In, and it's okay to have, right, acts of toleration as well. So in that case, let's say we change the facts a little bit. If that person did not have a legal right of way, it would have been essentially the same thing. So they would have been able to, right, um, the, the neighbor would have been able to let them cross the land without losing their ownership in any way, right? And in fact, eventually they might acquire a legal right of way if they do that to the exclusion of the owner. So they can acquire a partial property interest, right? This is not all that important, um, namely a right of way. So if instead of having exclusive possession, what they have is a right of way that's consistently used. They consistently have the three criteria there in, in crossing the, the, the path and the owner does not object for the statutory periods, so the 10 years, then they can acquire also partial property interest, which is a right of way, right? But again, that does not mean that, right, possession has to not be to the exclusion of the owner in general cases. Then we have a case as to innocent mistakes. Um, and the answer is essentially yes. So lots of complicated back and forth there, lots of, of, of um, contrasting precedent, but can you acquire 
possession um, in order to acquire eventually um, ownership, if we'll see the permutations of that, but either the owner or you and the owner are mistaken as to the fact that it is the owner's and the answer in the end is yes. So if you have a neighbor, you're mistaken as to where your land boundary is. And for 10 years, you act as though your land boundary were somewhere where it is not actually. So you're, say, um, on your neighbor's property, that strip of land you just stole from your neighbor for 10 years, involuntarily can be acquired by adverse possession. And you meet the criteria. You have the requisite intention and you in fact exclude the owner. That's the, 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 ultimate, um, the ultimate rule of law there, um, even though some of the cases say otherwise. So you have as these examples, the Piper case um, and the Ham case. So in the Piper case, you have a lady who fences in land that is not hers. And eventually the court says she can acquire it even though she didn't know it wasn't hers. Then you have the ham case where you have a guy build, I think, an airstrip on land that's not his. And the court says that he did not acquire ownership because the use that he made of the land was not inconsistent with that of the rightful owner. And that is no longer correct in law for our purposes. So, court says, the guy who bought the land bought it not to use it. He bought it as speculation, not to use it. So if he meant to build a house on it, and that was the purpose for which he bought the land, then potentially, right, by building an airstrip on it, you would have had a use that was to the exclusion of the owner with a requisite intent that actually excluded the owner. And then you're looking at the intention of the owner, which is confusing and odd because the person who does that doesn't know the intention of the owner. Anyway, so the owner intends for that to be used to build a house, then your use is inconsistent with it and it would count under the rule in that case, which as I said, does not apply anymore. However, if the guy buys it as real estate speculation, he intends to make no use of it for say 10 years and then just sell it at a profit. And pursuant to that case, then you could essentially never acquire ownership of it by virtue of possession because it would never be inconsistent with what the owner wants to do, which is nothing, right? You can't prevent the owner from doing nothing because their intent is to do nothing. And so in that case, they refused to give him ownership by virtue of possession because that possession was not inconsistent with what the owner intended to do with the land. And as we said, that doesn't apply anymore. So now we don't focus on the intent of the owner. We just focus on the intent of the person and some measurable, observable fact on what, the, what happened with the owner, namely that they were in fact excluded. That you don't have to get into the mind of the owner to figure out, right? It's obvious from the facts um, that you can observe. Take you to page 163. You have the definition of what it takes to acquire eventual ownership, and that's kind of important for our purposes. So you don't have to learn the words by heart, but they're helpful. So open, obvious, and continuous. What does that mean, right? Open means everyone can see it. And, and same definition, just a different way to put it. Open means everyone can see it. Obvious means everyone can see it. And continuous means uninterrupted because, as I said, the nature of the limitation period is that it has to run for the full period. So a single act that is contrary to what you have to prove, namely 
an act that is not to the exclusion of the owner. The owner shows up. That immediately stops the limitation period and it starts running again when they leave. That's what continuous means. And peaceful, open, and obvious. Same thing there. Peaceful meaning, and this is an additional rule that we'll see, not meaning that you're being nice because essentially you're making a use that is inconsistent with the rights of the owners. In some way you're doing something kind of illegal, at least in the sense of violating the owner's right to possession. However, you're not doing something kind of criminal by right, um, illegally taking possession of the land by, say, kicking out the owner, in which case we would penalize you. So you'll see um, in, some, in, in, in a later case, I'll we'll say that we don't reward trespassers. And so we have them meet an additional step, which is this one. Same thing as we saw with personal property, right? We said if you find something, you acquire possession of it, then you have a possessory interest. You have an interest to get possession back if someone takes it away from you. A corollary of that is that the person who takes it away from you does not have a possessory interest against you. They might against later people, but generally they don't because they took it wrongfully and we don't want to reward people who did something illegal. And so you have to have acquired possession lawfully generally and it's the same thing there with land. If you do something illegal, we won't reward you. By requiring that simple test, we will require an additional step, which is the one in the ham case, which I said is no longer the law. So if you're a bad person, then it is the law. And so on top of these things that you normally have to establish, you also have to establish that your use is inconsistent with the use of the owner. So if the owner is engaged in real estate speculation, bad people will never be able to acquire ownership over it. If they're engaged in um, something else, like building a house, right, then it will have to be inconsistent with the use that they intend to make of their property. And so to recap, basically, right, um, that means that most cases are going to be cases where, in fact, it is not adverse possession. So it's going to be cases where either people are mistaken, which we sent counts. Either one person's mistaken or the two people are mistaken. In both cases, you're not being bad, right? You're not breaking in um, and taking it away from the owner if the owner is mistaken. Second, you'll have cases where people are tolerating stuff, and that's sufficient. So if you let your neighbor fence in the property, that's not a mistake. You know that it's yours, but you let them because you don't want to get them mad, right? They still establish possession, they still intend to exclude you, and they still in fact exclude you because you don't show up. That counts, right? Even though you're doing that for a certain purpose, which is not to get your neighbor mad. One sixty-four. you have an important rule on intention, which is that generally it is presumed, which makes sense, right? So we will not require a subjective proof of your intention. So if you're on land, say, that's not yours, and you build a house on it, you, are, you have the action there, right? You're in possession because you are on it, right? And you built a house on it to the exclusion of the owner. The intention there is presumed. It is presumed that if you build a house, it's because you intend to possess it in the sense that the law requires, namely for a long period of time, right? So you intend to stay there, and so you build a house. You're not just there um, as, as a licensee, as someone who's been invited temporarily. You intend to act as the owner by establishing yourself on that piece of property. And so in that sense, intention is presumed. Namely, you don't have to show your subjective intention, for instance, as you would in the criminal law, right? In the criminal law, you have to show two things generally, the act and the intention. 
So you have to show that someone committed murder and you have to show that they're evil in the sense that they intended to commit murder. So if you kill someone by accident, it's not murder, it's killing someone, right? Same, things for, same thing for all other crimes, you have to prove a subjective intention, not what we're doing there. So you won't have to look at their diary, at what they told their friend, right, to figure out what their actual subjective intention is, to get into their mind and see what they intended to do. Instead, to the extent that it's clear from the action, it is presumed, right, and then if it's not clear, you'll look into the details of it. Right? You'll have subjective proof when it's not clear, when the facts are, quote, equivocal. That's page 164. All right, then you have the Wood case, which is also on, um, on the same issue of a mutual mistake, and that's where the court, um, the court in, in Ontario clarifies the law and says that mutual mistakes are okay. So if you have a mutual mistake, you can acquire ownership. It, it counts, right? Because it meets the criteria, because you have possession to the exclusion of the owner, even though it's only because the owner is mistaken about it. So basically, it doesn't make a difference that they don't know and that you don't know. And so that's basically the case, right? They're mistaken. Then they, 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 they hire a land surveyor. A land surveyor finds that it is not owned by the person they thought it was owned. Try to claim it back. Other person says, I've acquired ownership by virtue of possession during the limitation period, say it's 10 years, and the court says, yes, you did, and therefore the owner, even though they were wrong, cannot take it back. It's kind of a corollary of the underlying policy principles that we discussed, right? Which is that we don't want people to sleep on their rights, right? So we want you to know what's your property and to make a reasonable effort to investigate that, to figure it out, to hire a land surveyor and figure it out, otherwise you're being irresponsible and we don't want to reward that. Just like we don't want to reward the person that doesn't show up on their land for 10 years. And that's all generally because we want to have productive use of property, right? Because we want people to actually use their land and you won't use it if you don't know it's yours and you're sleeping on your rights. Same thing as if you don't show up and use it. And, and, and page 170, it's phrased in a way that's a bit um, confusing, but essentially if you have a mutual mistake, it's, it suggests that you meet the criteria, which makes sense, right? Because if both people are mistaken, it suggests that you actually excluded the owner. It's not a legal threshold, right? It's, it's a, 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 a similar to a presumption, isn't really a presumption, but it suggests that you have the intention and the exclusion right, because the other person was mistaken, as in my example where, when you fence in your neighbor's property. Um, the issue is to trespassers, so dishonest people, as we said, that's page 171, and again, that's from the Wood case. 171 and 72, you have the rule summarized at the bottom of page 172 there. So, with the inconsistent carried out by trespassers, right, either that they carried with them the implied permission of the owner or they negative the finding of the requisite intent to dispossess. So you have to show, as we said, something intentional. Page 177, again, you have the task that we've been discussing that's summarized in a way that's better than what I said, which is first actual possession, right? So physical possession that shows to everyone for the statutory period. So for the 10 years that you have to establish it for. Second, intention to exclude the owner from possession, right? 
Again, that communicative act. You show people that you intend for it to be yours. Again, for the statutory period, as we said, that's presumed, right? If your actions are clear, we'll presume that you have the subjective intention and your actions might not be clear, right? If you're just there in passing, then your actions aren't sufficient. If you build a house, they are sufficient because it evidences the requisite intention. Third, actual exclusion of the owner, as we said, it has to work again, throughout the statutory period. And that's where we'll stop for this week.